Hey y'all, this is Neil from The Overclocker. About a month ago, I got a great opportunity to sit down with the forever amazing and general nice guy, Dan Ragland of Intel, the senior principal engineer of performance tuning and overclocking. We spoke about DDR5, CU DIMMs, DRAM in general, and of course, the core ultra CPUs in their incredible IMCs. What follows is the first part of the interview, the second of which will follow soon enough. So without further delay on my side, this is how it all went down. What is your sort of involvement as Intel in terms of like developing memory standards in as far as you know? Like um, how many years ahead do you get involved? Do you suggest things to the JDAC and all of that? Like how does it actually work briefly? Yeah, in Intel has a team that's uh, working with, with JDAC and then also our memory controller and memory FI development team. They're looking five to 10 years out. So they're, they're deeply involved. They're working on uh, DDR6 uh and uh, related technologies right now so starts early oh five to ten years that's a long 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 time did you anticipate that we would have things like cu dims when the ddr5 standard was made or is that something that developed much later from my point of view uh cu dim did kind of come in a little bit later now there's probably some architects that were working that five to ten years out that had an inkling but yes yeah, cu dim was an opportunity that that came that we were able to seize to help uh, especially with some of the board designs that maybe needed uh, cleaner clocks, you know, they could be cost optimized or otherwise. Um, but then at the same time, that can be an opportunity for the future for overclocking. So we're looking at, um, you know, how can we use CU DIM to get those speeds up higher, even on, uh, you know, a reasonable price point board. DDR5, if I'm not mistaken, is somewhat very different from the previous generations of DDR, right? In many ways. What led to these changes? And if you don't mind, could you detail some of them just at a very high level? Like what was it that made you realize um, as the industry as a whole that actually going forth the way that DDR3 was, DDR4 wasn't actually the best way? And DDR5 would need some substantial changes. And what were those changes or that impetus that led to that decision? Sure, I'll start at a really high level. I mean, first of all, every generation we want to seek uh, some some potential power savings. So you saw that the voltage, what we would call VDD2, that rail uh, decrease in voltage from uh, about 1.2 volts to about 1.1 volts for that nominal. And then mm -hmm. uh, the PMIC, so that, that power management IC that's on the memory module comes into play. And that allows uh, you know, some autonomy within the module to manage voltage rails uh, there as well, and that that had a number of benefits. The other thing is we're seeking more more bandwidth, higher speeds, and uh, you know DDR4 wasn't going to get us uh, much further, um, so we, we needed to seek out something like DDR DDR5 that would have more headroom. There's so much uh, more to it beyond that, but that's kind of the high level. A lot of the things that I know were important for developing DDR5 was simply because of power. Does power in terms of uh, memory affect the CPU directly within, like in terms of how you manage power within the CPU? Sure, yeah. If we think of the whole uh, system power, um, you know, memory is a big part of, of, of that, especially when you have, say, four modules. So it, it can add up. And so we do want to, you know, my focus is overclocking, so we kind of ignore that a little bit. But for the rest of the world that does care about um, power, we've got some uh, some opportunities there and one of them that isn't necessarily tied to ddr5 that i wanted to, to highlight is uh, something we call sagv or system agent geyserville that's the idea that you can toggle between a higher uh, bandwidth um, and a lower bandwidth and at the same time you can take advantage of some power reductions uh, in the future that will include even voltage reductions uh, but for today um, it just happened to align with uh, ddr5 it was something that we were already you know, exploring with DDR4, but um, you'll see it becoming more ubiquitous with DDR5, this idea of toggling between a high, high frequency and low, lower frequency, not to save power. So in terms of XMP as well, is there an opportunity for us to see X, the XMP profile grow to dictate more things than it does right now uh, in terms of Essentially, um, right now it's primary timing, speed, and voltage, and so forth. But is there an opportunity to toggle between low power state, high power state, and all sorts of things like that? Absolutely. And uh, here's one where there's so many opportunities that I have to be restrained in how many we pursue because we don't want to okay. make it overly complex. Um, but yes, 
So, um, you know, I mentioned a second ago about uh, that system agent Geyserville, and that could be used for like inspect power savings. Uh, but we mm -hmm. we have a, a feature that um, is called uh, dynamic memory boost, and it can actually uh, be enabled uh, at the motherboard vendor's uh, choice, and it will uh, toggle between um, a POR speed or an inspect speed and a overclock speed uh, live in Windows based on an activity factor. So like if there's no activity, it'll drop down to normal POR speed, and if uh, you're playing a game or something that's highly active, it can bump the memory speed up. Um, that's something that we can uh, flag in those um, XMP profiles. Another one would be uh, the gear preference. You know, is it gear two or four? Um, uh, that could be flagged in there. Um, oh, and what I overlooked with my first example is uh, you can have up to five profiles with XMP 3.0. And so you could have uh, various um, overclocked profiles that you might toggle between as well. So that's another opportunity. So there's a lot more we could put in uh, XMP. One of the things is the reason I said I have to restrain myself on this is we don't want to overburden the memory vendors with the complexity of validating too many configurations. So while we have the five profiles, two of them being user defined profiles, um, we're you know trying to be careful to maybe not use more than a couple of those profiles uh, until the industry is ready to to validate that whole array. Oh, okay. That sounds pretty interesting. I think I've seen something similar to that on a Nasus board currently, actually, um, that allows the changing of uh, the transition, at least between a high power spec and a low power spec in, 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 in Windows, right? Um, yes. So I'm not sure necessarily what it's called right now, but I think I definitely have seen that as a feature. What I neglected to mention was that same SAGV technology has created the sandbox for innovation opportunity. So you will see some board vendors use that underlying technology and apply it in other ways. Like you could trigger based on temperature thresholds or other conditions besides the activity factor that I mentioned. So yeah, you will see some of those other board vendors really innovate with this uh, uh, technology. I also wanted to find out like memory validation is like critical, right? To compatibility performance and so forth, right? So your partners, um, for instance, Corsair, right? And others, right? How do they contribute to this process? And like, what kind of collaboration exists between you guys and the partners? Yeah, there's a lot of depth to this one. Uh, we work very closely with the memory uh, vendors. Uh, we consider them, you know, partners, co-travelers in this space, and their feedback is vital. So I'll, I'll take you as an example back to the uh, time where we were creating the XMP 3.0 spec that started um, back in 2019. And one of the first things uh, I did was uh, take a trip out to Taiwan and start meeting with the memory vendors and board vendors um, and uh, met with Coursera, for example, and, and G-Skill and, and Kingston and others. Uh, but we presented them with, here's what we're, we're working on. We're defining XMP 3.0. Here are some of the things we're thinking about doing. What do you, how do you feel about that? Um, how about the, how does the PMAC, PMIC get affected by this? Uh, do we need to enable um, PMIX for you? Or is this something you're taking care of to get the PMIX to support the higher voltage range? So we really start talking with them then. Uh, and then when we get into some of the uh, validation considerations, you know, we have the XMP self-certification program where vendors can execute a small test plan that we provide uh, on a particular module, processor, and board. And if uh, that passes, then that's when we would grant like XMP uh, certified. And so that's something we review with the vendors. And uh, you mentioned Coursera a minute ago, they're instrumental in giving us feedback about, hey, um, this test you have now doesn't usually ever catch any uh, of uh, issues. Um, but if you modify to this test, it's actually a little more um, useful. So we'll we'll take feedback like that and, and uh, tweak the test plan. And we highly value that, right? Because it's not just about what we want. It needs to be something that's good for the industry, good for our users. So there's a lot of back and forth with the memory vendors. So between memory vendors, uh, DRAM vendors, and yourselves, actually, I've seen a list that you had for in a while ago. I can't find it now on your website, but it actually had the highest speeds or validated speeds for XMP on particular boards, and it would state like which BIOS version, which memory, which motherboard, which CPU as well. Um, is that something that's continually being updated? Yeah, it is. Um... So that would be on uh, intel.com forward slash overclocking. That's that's how you would get to that page. And then you skip down to the XMP section. And there's a, basically an Excel spreadsheet of all the different modules tested on 
uh, the various platforms. Um, it sometimes uh, it's a chicken and the egg situation. So sometimes that might lag a little bit on launch. But I would also say you might also um, check out the memory vendors uh, AVL. So they have a materials list where they uh, augment this with their own testing. And so you'll find uh, in two places. One is on the memory vendors uh, websites. They'll have their own uh additional testing and then also on the motherboard vendors you'll find another avl so if you're looking for memory compatible for your certain uh system uh, there's actually three different places to look at and uh it would be nice if if we unified down to to one location but there's a benefit in doing this it's speed so the memory vendors and the board vendors can react very fast and get that that posted uh, and then when you see uh a Few, several months post launch, you'll see a mature list starting to develop on that uh, Intel.com uh, XMP uh, certified table as well. I know that uh, with 14, 14th gen core CPUs, uh, in my experience and other people as well, that it was always easy for us to know relatively that, okay, the CPU has a great IMC, so therefore it should be able to do memory at X speed, right? But with the Core 200 series, it seems to be not as clear cut as we thought it was, at least with 14th gen CPUs. Like, is this, this rating that we had, for instance, on ASUS boards, it was an SP rating on gigabyte it's CPU biscuits and so forth. Is this still relevant for this generation, this Core Ultra 200 series of uh, uh, CPUs? Yeah, those SP scores that I think you see ASUS and other vendors have similar um, are using criteria that uh, they've developed. It's very clever, um, but I might suggest um, things have changed a little bit with this generation. I think they've actually uh, changed for the better. It used to be that if you had um, an i9 um, versus an i5, that uh, you would find the, the i9 would always have like way higher memory capabilities in terms of frequency. But uh, on our current generation, you'll find a little more uniformity, which is which is kind of cool that the, the uh, Ultra fives um, actually are pretty pretty well dialed into where the Ultra nines are, and uh, there are some reasons for that. The distributions are a little bit tighter in terms of the memory uh, capabilities. So if you think of a bell curve, it's a it's a narrower curve today versus a wider curve in the past, and there are reasons for that that I'm not able to get into today. But I think it's a it's a cool a change because now when you if you do decide to buy that Ultra seven, for example. Um, you're going to find a lot more uh, memory uh, capabilities than maybe in the past where you'd have to buy that i5 to get there. Actually, so. that's exactly what I've experienced. Um, and I've actually noticed as well that a lot of the high-speed memory validations by DRAM vendors, some of them are using that like 265K or the 245K, whereas previously it was mostly the high-end SKU, like the Core i9 and so forth. Uh, exactly right. Yep, that's that's a main component of it. I think I misspoke a minute ago, by the way. Uh, I was trying to articulate that, um, you know, in the past, you might need that i9 to, to have the highest memory speed, and the i5 might, you know, uh, be a lower memory max. Um, and uh, today, the Ultra 9, Ultra 7, and Ultra 5 are actually much more tightly grouped in terms of their uh, uh, capability there. Uh, so with that narrower uh, bell curve. So it's kind of cool. I think you'll probably see this stick around this trend and it should be exciting for uh, customers as well. I, I hope they enjoy that. Okay. So I wanted to ask as well. Um, so the 14th gen CPUs, right, had both, if I'm not mistaken, again, uh, DDR4 controller and a DDR5 controller, essentially, right? Um, obviously, that's been the DDR4 controller has been removed on the Core Ultra 200 series. Does this help in any shape, way, or form? Like, what advantages do you get from that, essentially? Yeah, so you're right. It has been removed, so it's DDR5 exclusive. Um, well, I think I'm pretty proud of the work that the, the memory architects and developers did on, on our latest generation because they've been able to essentially hit higher speeds, much higher speeds uh, than in the past. Um, it allowed them to focus, right? So when you try to have compatibility between DDR4 and DDR5, just think about it from a memory reference code standpoint. You've now got your team kind of looking in two different, completely different architectures from a memory perspective and trying to optimize for both. So it really allowed them to dig deep on DDR5 and just make DDR5 you know, it, its best. And, and I think uh, the speeds we're seeing on, on DDR5 are just amazing that... Uh, you know, we were testing this 285 uh, 
uh, Kay the other day and and uh, man, you know, 8,000 is a no, it's a given, you know, it's just kind of automatic. And uh, so anyways, it allowed them to focus and really deliver on DDR5. And I also wanted to ask as well, so we've seen the different gearing modes. They're not new, of course. I think these existed in uh, for the 14th gen CPUs as well, but they've become more prevalent or more topical with the Core Ultra 200 series, right? And could you explain, like, how do how, how do these actual modes work, like, sim in the most simple way that you can? Like, yeah. So the, it has to do with the frequency that the uh, memory controller is operating at versus the DRAM frequency. So gear two, the memory controller would be half of the DRAM frequency, whereas gear four, it would be a quarter of the DRAM frequency. So um, what it allows you to do, let's say the uh, gear four is going to get you to those higher speeds. Now the the, the downside of, of gear four is your latency is going to go um, up. So you really have to decide: is it a game that's really uh, latency focused? Then you your goal would be to use gear two to the highest frequency you can attain. But if you were like a content creator or you're moving huge amounts of data, you might decide to go with gear four um, and take a take a small latency hit in order to get pretty big uh, bandwidth gains. Okay. Do you envision a time where like running like super high speeds uh, uh, in gear four actually would compensate for the loss of latency efficiency, at least if I may say that uh, in gear two, like as the speeds ramp up for DDR5 CU DIMMs and so forth? I think over time, it's pretty inevitable that that, that will happen. We're at this kind of threshold of this transition period right now where, you know, uh, it's hard to see that coming. Uh, but yeah, into the future, when we talk about speeds attainable by the average person on their home system over 10,000 mega transfers, then I think uh, there'll be a point where uh, the bandwidth will be worth it. You know, if you were doing something AI or NPU heavy, you may really want uh, that that bandwidth. Uh, and uh, so, so some of those, what I'm trying to say, some of those use cases might be available today. But uh, you know, there's we're so focused on gamers, and uh, so for gamers uh, right now, it's it's all about gear two. Oh, okay. So actually, I've seen as well that um, the same memory on the 14th gen core CPUs, for some reason, particularly the 24 gigabit M ICs, are doing so much better now on the Core Ultra 200 series of CPUs. Is that just IMC improvements that you guys made? Sure, the IMC plays a big role. Uh, there is something special about those uh, 24 uh gigabit density uh, uh, DRAM, they they do oh. tend to have higher capabilities for uh, frequency. And you'll have to ask the, the DRAM folks uh, why that is, uh, but it does seem to be pretty pretty uniform that um, you know, that design is just, uh, you know, tends to have more headroom. Uh, it tends to do well uh, uh, with with latencies and, and frequencies alike. Frankly, it's, uh, it's it's been pretty impressive. So when you see now, 48 gigabyte capacity modules or 24 gigabyte capacity modules those tend to be based on that 24 that gigabit density uh, DRAM and it's it's really become a sweet spot oh okay yeah I've been seeing a lot of those so yeah I'm, I'm always happy to see uh, more frequency better latencies and so forth right <laughs>